If you would please stand for the reading of God's word, Revelation chapter 5, all 14 verses. Hear the word of God for the people of God. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on, on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And we had taken the scroll, <coughs> the four living creatures, and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and the golden bowl and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering in myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. By your Spirit, we have been granted a glimpse into heaven. And I pray this glimpse into heaven would have a profound effect upon us here now on earth. This was written and recorded for our posterity that we might get a sense of what it is like in heaven so that here we might have some of that heaven on earth. That we might reflect to the world this, in this world of darkness and depravity the glorious light of heaven. And I pray that, Lord, you would move mo much more than simply our minds, but that you would move our hearts through this scripture. For I do pray this in Christ's name. Amen. What is really interesting <clears throat> is how what God does is different than what most people think. The book of Revelation is written to a group of people, original, its original authors or original recipients, who were beginning to experience hardship and difficulty um, because of their Christian faith. And it was not going to get any better. And, and the, the, any perusal of Christian history indicates that to be a Christian in most times and in most places was a costly proposition. And by the grace of God, we're going to taste that. You know, nobody wants to taste it, but it's, it's amazing. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings. And we are going to be brought and given the privilege to rejoice. Paul says, it is granted to you not only to believe, but to suffer for Jesus. Now, I, I understand that seems really strange and bizarre. So here, <clears throat> these believers are on the precipice cusp of, of all sorts of difficulties, hardship for their faith. And John, <clears throat> by the inspiration of the Father through the Son, writes to them to encourage and help them. How in the world are you going to survive? 
How are you going to put up with it? And, and you know what? <clears throat> All you have to do is pick up the newspaper. Well, I guess there's hardly any newspapers anymore, but it doesn't take much to, to see where the trajectory of our culture is going. And, it, and no longer are the people who are in control in, in our government and who are in the, at the academy, they're not, shy, they're not shying away that basically religious freedom is something that must be done away with. It's too, it's do, too they argue, too debilitating for society. So we're in the crosshairs and it's coming our way. So what is the most, what is, if you say, what, what would be the greatest help given to Christians in any generation to, in, in their suffering? And the book of Revelation gives it clear portrait of this. What we need is a clear sight of who God is. That, is, as Ben was saying, is the compass. I think one of the things that is so problematic of our culture <clears throat> in, in uh, Nietzsche was a philosopher. He had a famous quote, and one of the quotes was is that we have unchained the earth from the S-U-N. And what he was saying in, in culture, we have basically taken the earth away from its gravity, and what happens? <laughs> okay. Well, the problem with what the church, unfortunately, has done is it has unchained itself from the S-O-N. Jesus is not the preeminent one. He has a function, a place. But I, I, I think it's so strange because I, I attentively listen to Christian radio stations just to see and hear. And one of the things is that Jesus is often missing. He's just not there. Now <clears throat> we turn to heaven and we see <clears throat> the focus. In chapter 4, we looked at this first scene that John was given of heaven. And the predom remember, what, what was the predominant word, the predominant thing, the, the thing that overshadowed everything in the first part of the Revelation in chapter 4? It occurred 12 times in that chapter, five, five times in this chapter, and a total of 32 times in the whole book of Revelation, the throne. Okay? Very little is just talked about the one who sits on the throne because essentially he is beyond description, but the throne is there. And the point is this. John is telling these people who are going to suffer God is in absolute control. He never has relinquished the control. No one can take it out of his hand. You must understand. Burn it in your minds and be certain that no matter what befalls his people, he sits on the throne. And people will say, well, we'll cast his bonds asunder. We will rebel. We'll do our own things. Okay. Because he that sits in heaven laughs and holds them in derision. We have to understand that. And that's what, the, the, if you will, the thrust of, of chapter 4 is that he's on the throne. And all of heaven rejoices of his holiness and his, the, the power of his creation. <clears throat> it's kind of like a wide-angle lens. We get a kind of a big panorama of heaven and God being in charge of everything. Chapter 5, instead of it going from this big wide angle, it focuses in and, and, and concentrates on one single thing. It begins... John says, and I saw, and here was the throne, and the one who sat on the throne, and one, if you will, the camera is focused in on his right hand, and in his right hand is a scroll. Oh, yes, thank you, Mike. It would help to turn it on, wouldn't it? So in this chapter, I want to cover four things. The scroll in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, the search for the one to open the, the scroll, the unveiling of the lion lamb, and the celebration of the lamb. So we see this, and we're just going to work our way through <clears throat> with, hopefully, great encouragement. The first of these is the scroll. It's described <clears throat> as being written on the inside and the out, full of detail, and sealed with seven seals. Now, there's a whole bunch of discussion. What in the world, why is it described this way? It is almost certain, whether some want to argue that this is a, like, a, like a last will and testament, because in ancient Rome... A last will and testament was like this, and it was always sealed with seven seals. Other times, this, a, a document was like a deed or a contract, a deed of ownership, was also sealed with seven seals. What is clear is that this is communicating to us that in the hand of the one who sits on the throne is a very formal and absolutely essential document that is sealed and that it is reserved for one and only 
one to see. Um, <clears throat> it's written on the outside and the inside, and the idea is that on the outside probably is a brief description of what this holds, and inside are the contexts. Now, the reason they sealed it was twofold. One, to prevent tampering. Okay, so you got a, you got a document, and it's sealed. And usually what happened, it was a glob of wax, and then there was an imperial ring or a ring it was imprinted so that if anybody got in the document, they would have to break the wax seal. And guess what? It's invalid. You know that it was tampered with. That was, it was designed to protect from somebody fidgeting with it. This, this, this is a document of, of profound importance. As I said, my, with my son adopting uh, a girl from, <clears throat> uh, from Colombia, there's, all, there's this, this, this formal thing called apostelia, apost something, I can't even pronounce it, but it's, it's, it's far more important than a not <clears throat> notoriety, a not no, a notary. This is a, this is a worldwide acceptance formality, and you have to have it because this is international adoption. Well, this is so important <clears throat> that it's sealed with seven seals. Also, not only is it not to be messed with, but it also it means that only one person can open it, the one whom it was designated for. So we see here in the right hand of him who sat on it, this scroll. Now the question is, what in the world is this scroll? There's all sorts of discussions, but you can, you can see because as we progress in chapter 7 or 6, this is when I watched the Lamb open one of the seals, then all this stuff took place. The book of Revelation is simply the content of, the outworking of the content of the scroll. And you know what we see? You see two things. You see, first of all, judgment. Judgment is a pretty significant part of the book of Revelation, isn't it? We live in a day and age where people think there's, there, there's absolutely no sense of sin, is there? There's no sense of sin. There's nothing wrong. And the only thing that is wrong are those people who say there's things that are wrong. You know, we kind of like in the period of Judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and there was no king in the land. And that's exactly what it is. And essentially, we are our own gods. We are our own law. We do whatever we want to do, and that's the ultimate freedom. Well, the book of Revelation comes and says, not so fast. This is not our world. Chapter 4 concludes with the fact that God created us, and God created all things, and God sustains all things, and therefore, all things and all people are accountable to God. And the time will come when God's long-suffering and patience is over, and he pours upon this world the justice that's deserved. But a particular part of that justice is the fact that, and you see, we'll see this, is that the world hating God takes it out on God's people. And we will see in, in Revelation that there will be many, 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 whose lives will be taken solely because they're faithful to Christ. Not because they have broken laws, not because they are vicious and, and murderous people, but because they love Christ. And so Christ will break this and bring forth judgment in, in punishment and vindication of his people. But also, not only is this this scroll contains judgment, but it also contains redemption. Because we see the unfolding and the completion of God's work. Um, I don't like more and more any modern movies or modern TV shows or stuff because there is a, a, an underlining Dys dysphoria. There's, there, there is an underlying because basically people have the sense that nothing has purpose or meaning and so it's kind of dark. It's kind of foreboding. And, and, it's, and even the way in which they film things is, is foreboding and dark. Because essentially modern thinking there is no purpose to history. That's it. The scroll, I'm going to give it a funny thing, is, is, is the statement and the surety of a happy ending. I like movies that have a happy ending. I've used the illustration before I watched a movie with my wife. I didn't know anything about it. This woman had cancer, brain cancer, and she was a teacher. 
and she went through all the surgery. She lost her sight and, and about, you know, a bunch of things. So she finally got back to being able to teach. And you know, I'm like, wow, yes. And she, she drives for her first day back to school. And, you know, and this is how the movie ends. She's driving and she turns in and you see the name of the school, Columbine. And she was the one, one of the teachers that died. And I was so furious. I said, I do not like movies like that. I am a person who wants a happy ending. Now, maybe you call me old-fashioned. I don't care. This scroll is the guarantee of the happy, holy ending. Revelation 22 and 20, or 21 and 22 is that happy ending. And that's the point. This is going to have a happy ending. I wrote some time ago, talked to you about Greek comedy. Now, we think of comedy as one thing. Comedy for the Greeks was you're up here, you fall down here, and then you're brought back here. You're brought back to where you fell. That was Greek comedy. What we find in the work of Christ is that this is not like that at all. It's, you're, we're here, we're down here, then we're way up here. When we take, we'll take some time when we get to those last chapters because I want you to understand the happy ending promised. I love the phraseology of C.S. Lewis. He says in the last, uh, his last book in the Chronicle of Narnia series, Farewell to Shadowland. This is just shadow. This scroll is the guarantee of a happy, of the happy and holy ending. So here it is, scroll, and there is a search for one to open it. I mean, this is important in the call by this, this angel with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and to basically execute the contents of that scroll. This is so important and so significant that it rests the entire attention of heaven. This one sitting on the throne and in his right hand is this scroll. And there's clear indication that in some sense, everybody had a, con have had a sense of what the contents were, were in it. The extent of the search was exhaustive. It was in earth and on earth and, under, excuse me, in heaven, on earth and under the earth, extensive and exhaustive. And after the search was made, what? No one was found able. Notice that no one was found able to open the scroll. And such a thing caused John to weep loudly. It's over with. There will be no truly happy and holy ending. I mean, do you want to continue with a world like it is? Almost every day, Monday morning I read the news, and they, they give statistics of how many people were shot and killed in Chicago. I read an article about a man in prison. <clears throat> this was the, the, the guards are being uh, found guilty of this. They, they had a cellmate, and the cellmate fashioned a knife, cut the guy's, his cellmate's head off, took various body parts and made a necklace and wore it around. I mean, isn't that ghastly? I mean, one of the things, we, we, the weird thing is we, we celebrate violence in a sense. There's a famous series, what is it called? The Silence of the Lamb? And it's about what? A mass murderer, right? Okay, but the point, though, is it's like, wow. You know, the murder should be something that is beyond, uh, what? What's murder? The whole world we live is violent and dark and corrupt and, and, and that. And John was thinking there will be that forever. Could, what happens if things continue on this trajectory forever? Imagine what humanity would be like if the trajectory we're on now just keeps going on and on. Would you not also weep loudly? What hope is there? John hadn't experienced what we had. He lived in the Roman world, it was bad, but it, it just, it's just worse and worse and worse and just getting, oh my, oh my. And there was great and profound weeping throughout the entire of heaven. John was just beside himself because there was no hope, he thought. But there was one who was found worthy. Now it's interesting. A search was found in heaven and earth and under the earth. 
and no one was found. You, you have a question? I do. What's the question? Huh? Why, where was Christ in all this, right? I mean, hello, if you make an extensive search, don't you think a part of that extensive search would be Christ? I think what it's saying is this. The extensive search was made among those of Adam's lot. Those who were born naturally of Adam, even the redeemed who come from Adam. Every human being, no matter who, has a tainted nature, true? And even though they are redeemed, and I think the 24 represent the redeemed, they are redeemed at a price. And they are not intrinsically and inherently pure. So the search was made among all mankind. And none, not a one, was found worthy. No man, no woman ever born of Adam will ever, would ever be worthy and able to open that document. But there was a man worthy, thank God. And it had to be a man, because all of this, you understand, is the undoing of the fall. And who fell? Who fell? Man. Man blew it. And man had to bring it back. That's why there's this big play. There is two heads of man, two races, Adam's race and Christ's race. Jesus Christ was fully man. And the point of this, among all man, the search was made and there was no one worthy. No one of man, no one of Adam was fit to open this. But there was a man of God. Truly man, flesh and blood like you and I, yet without sin. Who was there? And I just, I love, you know, because you're going to see what happens. Because here it is. And so John's just weeping and just beside himself and he can't understand what's going on. And he really realizes that if that document is not open, there is no hope at all. And one of the elders says, puts his arm on his shoulder, says, John, it's okay. Don't weep, for there is one. And mind you, only one that is fit to open the scroll and to execute its contents. He says, I'm going to describe him to you. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That goes back to Genesis 49, 9 and 10. As, as Jacob is blessing his children, he pronounces them a blessing. And, and the blessing he pronounces on Jacob essentially is, out of your hand the scepter will not, will not leave. That is, there will be a king. The best government and the only fit government is a monarchy. A monarchy by a perfect king. Well, ooh, that really leaves out the impossibility of monarchy, isn't it? Except there is a perfect king. You look at the kings of Israel, all of them are flawed, but they are a picture, a shadow of the one king to come. And what, what this elder says to John, who is fully versed, you know he is soaked in the Old Testament because the, the, the words, phraseology, the context, the holy of, of Revelation is an echo after echo after echo of the Old Testament. And what John says, what the elder says, John, it, remember the lion of the tribe of Judah? He's here. He's here finally. And you can rest. He's going to take the throne. It's really interesting because he says of the lion of the tribe of Judah, he calls them the root of David. Now, it goes back to Isaiah 11, and there the, the branch of Jesse is spoken. Enough. And the idea is that there will be, the, it's prophetic, the whole Davidic kingdom will in a sense be hacked down and seemingly ruined. <clears throat> uh, if you've ever, how many of you ever dealt, I mean guys principally, ever dealt with mulberry trees? You cut them down. Okay, you just cut them suckers down. And what happens? Got come something else, right? Well, the picture is because of the sins of the nation, the Davidic line is cut down, seamless, same thing, just gone. And out of this stump will come a branch, and that branch will be the Messiah. But this is really interesting because it's, it's a role reversal. It does not say the branch of David. It says the root of David. And you know what? This is a profound statement. Because you know what? This one, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and we know as Jesus Christ, 
in fact is the source behind David, though he was the product of David. He, gave, he came through the line of David, but the reason why David was king was because he was king. He preceded David. That's why it says Jesus asked that really interesting question. How did, you know, you know, was, you know how did, why did David say, the Lord said to my Lord? This, was, this is a profound statement that Jesus Christ, that the Son of God predated David. He's the, that's why, because that's why, I mean, if David was the great example of the king, why was he? Because there was the king who was, David was a shadow. Now the shadow is gone and the king is here. He's conquered. He has won a victory. And one of the things you're going to see is, is the constant, constant, constant reminder that the victory in which that Jesus won, and I'm going to say it now and I'll say it a hundred times, was a victory accomplished by death. <clears throat> I'm jumping ahead a bit. From this point on in the book of Revelation, so many times Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. The Lamb. And you say, well, what, why? Because John wants us never to forget the death of Christ. The sacrificial death. But we'll get there. So, because he's the line of the true of Judah, and because he's the root of David, he has conquered. Therefore, he can. He has the ability and the right to open this document, to take it out of the hand. So John is excited now. He says, man, I can't. I mean, all my life I've waited, if you will, as a, as a faithful Jew for the Messiah. And here he is. He's described to me as the lion that tried to, you know, me, man. And I told you before, I've seen a lion behind a cage. And it's terrifying. You know, there was, was in Houston, a, lot, a tiger is a lot smaller than a lion, but there was a, a, a tiger uh, running around in Houston. Okay? Would you like to go out, you know, mowing your yard and come around the side and see a tiger face to face? Well, John expects us, to, when he turns around, to see this dominating, fiercest, fier fierce and warrior-like animal, and he sees... A lamb standing. A lamb standing? What a, what a shock. <laughs> what a contrast. What a, what a point that was, would, would certainly have, have caused him to think. What does he see? He sees a lamb standing. A lamb standing that gave sight that had had been slain. Here and, 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 and later on, the word used tells us that this lamb slain, slaughtered, if you will, in sacrifice, forever that death remains significant. He was resurrected. He's standing. But the death will never lose its significance. His, his being slain will forever have eternal importance. He says he has seven horns. In the Old Testament, the word horn means strength and power. You see it in the book of Daniel. You see all these creatures with all these horns, and it indicates that they are powerful. And the more horns they have, the more powerful they are. It's, just, it's a metaphor, a picture. Well, Christ here is pictured as having seven horns. Now, please don't try to construct in your mind what this looks like. You know why? It will be something grotesque. It will be a chimera uh, uh, that will cause you to come up with nightmares. It's not so much for you to construct an image, but for you to have a sense of what's going on. Here is this lamb standing, resurrected from the dead, and having complete and total power. You know, right now, we, you know, we, we live in the 20th century. We all live through the Cold War. And uh, how many of you ever remember the, all the advertisements about building bomb shelters? Remember that? My, my father, I, was, I wasn't very old, but my father got these plans, and he was thinking of building a bomb shelter. I still remember to this day, uh, I went to Fairchild, now it's the mission, and I can remember we had um, bomb threat tests. Remember that? We had to go in the basement, because, you know, like, okay, here comes a nuclear bomb, we're going to go down the basement and be as safe as we can. Okay. And, you know, right now, the, the idea is what's called mad mutual assured destruction. So the reason why we're not blowing up everybody, because if they shot a missile, we'd shot, you know, that type of thing. 
We are in a cold war. We're always that. You know, there's always that. Right now, our big nemesis is China. You know, you know, you know and it, it's, it's growing. And, oh, what's going to happen? You know, like, they've got power. We've got power. So let's not go to war. Well, the picture of Christ is that there is no comparison. He has all power. He has all strength. There's nothing limited. There's nothing limiting him. He's not ever beside himself. He is absolutely and exhaustively and extensively in control. He's got all the power. He's omnipotent. Simply a, 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 a metaphorical way of saying it. But it goes on to the next. It says he has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. You know what that means? He by the activity of the Spirit of God, is fully informed of everything. I don't know about you, but I began more and more to become very, very suspicious about almost everything that I get from the news. Okay, honestly. I can remember, because this was... This COVID-19 developed in a wet market in Wuhan and absolutely had no chance of coming out of a lab. Now guess what the scientists are saying? I read an article that they said because of the, the, the structure of the actual COVID, there are four amino acids that are all positive ions. They said that never occurs in nature. I mean, but that's what they, it's like, boom. I don't know. I honestly don't know. There's so many things I don't know. I have questions. I was asked by one of my supervisors, are you vaccinated? And we went and had this discussion. And I basically, basically I said, I don't know what to trust. Really, what do you trust? What do you know for certain? The answer is nothing. What does Christ know for certain? Everything. And he knows it perfectly. Because not only does he know the externals, he knows the internals. The Spirit of God is everywhere. And oh, here's this lamb. He knows everything. He has all power. There is nothing, you know, it says in Isaiah that, 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 that darkness is like light to him. There's nothing that is hidden from him. He knows everything perfectly. That's the lamb. And now here comes a picture. This lamb. It's, it's, it's hard to describe because the language used here is where is he located? But one thing is clear. It says that he is in the midst of the 24 elders. There is an association that he makes with his people, an association that he never loses. From out from out of this, this group of the 24 elders, he goes and takes out of the hand of, the, of him that sits on the throne the scroll. But before I get to the next point, now I don't know if you noticed, a bunch of the songs we sang carried and communicated Christ in his glory, but especially the meekness and majesty and the next one, he is altogether lovely, is actually almost all of them are taken from a sermon by Jonathan Edwards. Here's seven points. I wasn't going to give you the whole sermon by John Edwards called The Excellency of Christ. Anyhow, you know, think about this. He says, in the person of Christ meets infinite glory. You think of the transfiguration? Wow, right? And lowest humility? He was. Huh? Try to make that. In the person of Christ meets together infinite majesty and transcendent meekness. Almost those exact phrases are in one of the songs we sang. Now, you know, you don't have to give a credit to, you know, because the guy's long dead. But I just wanted to show you that the source of much of this is from a sermon long written. Yeah. This is the, uh, third. There meet in the person of Christ the deepest reverence toward God. And isn't that true? I mean, you see in Jesus an absolute reverence to God, the Father. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, right? And at the same time, I and the Father are one. There are conjoined in the person of Christ infinite worthiness of good. There is nothing found. He, Jesus says to his, his, his opponents, which of you can convict me of sin? Is there anything in me that's bad? And you know what? Even his, even his enemies couldn't. And yet, and yet what we find is the greatest patience under suffering. I mean, he's on the cross. And he looks at the people who actually committed, I mean, executed him. And what does he say to them? Of them. Father, forgive them, for they, these, these Romans don't know what they're doing. I don't think that's what I would have been asking, talking. 
you know, I'd say, you know, fry them. In the person of Christ are conjoined an exceeding spirit of obedience. Jesus, do, did Jesus ever disobey? <laughs> did he? Absolutely not. Bob often references in the book of Hebrews where it says it was his ear was dug down. This is how Jesus was when it came to the Father, wasn't it? Yes, Father. What do you want me to do now? And he obeyed gladly. And even when it came to the point where it was so humanly almost impossible to bear, says if, if it's possible for this cup to pass. But, 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 nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. So you have this, this exceeding spirit of obedience at the same time with, with supreme dom, uh, dominion over heaven and earth. In the person of Christ are conjoined absolute sovereignty and perfect resignation. Into your hand I commit my spirit. And seventh, in Christ meet together self-sufficiency and an entire trust and reliance on God. And if you want, you can, you can download the sermon. It's the Excellency of Christ. It's a wonderful sermon. This is just... Because what you see here, and it's, it's, it's all spurned by this, this really beautiful contrasting picture, a lion. And, and it goes on, it says, you have a lion-like lamb and a lamb-like lion. Which is it? Yes. <laughs> because is not Christ pictured as a lion? And is he not pictured as a lamb? He is a lamb-like lion and a lion-like lamb. And what it is meant to do is not so much to confuse us, but to awe us. To just to overwhelm us. So we, have, we are introduced to the one who is worthy and able to that. And so he walks forward to the throne. We see this in verse 7. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on, throne, on the throne. So he walks up. He alone is fit. He alone is worthy. He is alone has the right takes it out of the hand, and all of a sudden there is this explosion of worship in heaven. I mean, it, boom, because it says, notice this, and when he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, and when he had taken the scroll, then happens this, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a, a harp and a golden bowl of full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So what happens here? You're going to th three stages of praise. It's like, it's like you drop a, uh, a, a rock in the water. You have concentric circles. You have, the one, you have a, 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 a stage of praise that immediately around the throne. Then another stage out farther, and then another stage. And these are three stages of, of praise and worship to the Lamb. <clears throat> the first stage occurs once, once the... Lamb and the lion, a lamb like lion and the lion like lamb takes from the hand of him who sits on the throne the scroll and immediately the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down and they're going to sing a new song. A new song. And why I think it's a new song is because it's all about to be made right. It's all about to come to a new heaven and a new earth. This is a song that, that reflects what's going to happen. But before you see that, before anything is said or sung, there is this immediate prostration of the, the four living creatures and the 24 elders before the Lamb. Now, this clearly tells you something. The Lamb is God. Later in the book of Revelation, John falls down before an angel. He says, get up, get up. No, no, no. I'm a fellow servant. Only worship God. Was there any objection to these uh, four elders or the 20, or four living creatures or the, or the 24 elders? Did Jesus say, please don't worship me? It was absolutely appropriate and right for the worship. And so they go and they worship. Then they sing the new song. It begins with these words. Worthy are you to take the scroll. Worthy. You're worthy to take it, and you're worthy to open it. You alone will bring about that happy and holy ending. 
Why are you worthy? You don't, have to ask, you don't have to guess. It says, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why are you worthy? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Now, here's a secret. Jesus died. He shed his blood to buy for his, for his father a people. Okay? The, the purpose, principal purpose of Christ's death is not merely to keep people out of hell, but to purchase for his father a people. The Abrahamic covenant and all, I will be your God and you will be my people. The happy day is when we are in the presence of God, he being our God, and we being his people. That's, that's why he was worthy. He came as a man. He died. He bought for him, for his father, a people. Right. In uh, John 17, constantly we are referred to as the gift the father gave to the son. And the way in which the, the son bought those people was by his blood, his shedding of his blood. And the thing that is so growingly infuriating in me is how there is a current in Christianity that just kind of wants to get away from this bloody religion stuff. Get away from the fact that death was required, that Christ, oh, that, that whole idea that he was, you know, he died on the cross, just a little bit too, you know, too, too medieval for the 21st, thing, 21st century. We'll, we'll just kind of put that down. Well, here, the central theme central focus worthy is the lamb why is the word why is the lamb worthy because he was slain he shed his blood and it was by the payment of his blood that the people were purchased jesus you know the angel came and says you will call his name jesus for he shall what he will save his people from their sins then he goes on it says not only were you slain and not only did you pay for the ransom of your people with your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation it's everywhere it's everywhere the kingdom of god has gone everywhere and it's going everywhere from paul says i went from rome to illyricum from jerusalem to illyricum i mean and 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 the the, the gospel word is keep is keeping going around the world today and it says, and you have made them a kingdom and priest. Probably the idea of those two words is a, 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 a kingdom of priests to our God. And it's not, the, the idea of priest here is not that we offer sacrifice, though that was one of the things, but it talks about the ability to be in the presence of God. Back when we studied Exodus and Leviticus, who alone could go in the holy, of place, the holy place? Only the priests. Then, you, then the Holy of Holies only once a year, and that was the high priest. The picture of the kingdom of priests is this, folks, and you'll see this at the end. Absolute, free, unencumbered access to God. Wow. Right now we see, Paul says, we see through a, a glass dimly. So much of the time our thoughts and affections toward Christ are so cold and indifferent, aren't they? But not then. He says, the time is going to come where every one of the blood-bought people of God will be priests. That is, they will have unbridled access to God. <laughs> what will that be like? I mean, seriously. I mean, sometimes we have prayer time, and it's just so sweet, and we read, you know, and other times it seems so distant. There will be no, nothing between my soul and the Savior, nothing of this world's delusive dreams. Absolute, direct, face-to-face -face encounter. That's what the lamb purchased. And there is, I do not understand this, but we will reign. And it's not just the millennium. I mean, there, there's, there's an aspect of that. But the, clearly the language used here extends beyond the millennium. There is a sense in which, and I think this, I think it's this. When God created man, Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden and gave them command. And essentially, what, were, what was Adam and Eve to do? They were to multiply but that just not multiply, but what do what? Dress and keep the garden. And it's really interesting. The word keep is actually the word that, that was used of the priest keeping the, the tabernacle. 
and they were to multiply and they were to extend. And I, the, the picture seems to be this. God created man and put them in a, 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 a garden east of Eden, which was a sanctuary, a, a special place for God's presence. And what God said, he says, now, make the whole world my temple. Now, we're going to see that in Revelation 21 and 22. So what, what, what's going to happen after that? I think, this is my, my take, this is totally my opinion, but I think the business of making the universe the temple of God will be our unending, joyful duty. I mean, can you see, how big is the universe? Now, make every single corner a temple to God. Every single place a, 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 a sanctuary to the beloved, the beloved Savior. I mean, how long will it take? Oh, it could take zillions of years. No problem. We have it. So that's the first stage. The second stage begins in verse 11. Then I looked and I heard around the throne, just outside of the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Now, you can actually calculate, you know, what this number is. It's not, I don't think it's meant to be an axiom number. I think it means this. There are angels that you couldn't count. Now, so many angels that you couldn't go, or, you know, you can go, you know, there's no way. There's just massive created beings. And in unison, they say with a loud voice. Now, think about it. How, how loud is one angel? <laughs> now, imagine innumerable, innumerable angels, all with a loud voice saying, worthy is the Lamb. Now notice this, what? Who was slain. Okay? Don't ever forget that. And I think that's why, as I said, from this point on, the mo one of the most common terms for Jesus, the Messiah, is the Lamb. For us to realize what's at the center of the redemptive work was his slaughter. Worthy is the Lamb. Then it gives a list of seven things. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now, don't think for a moment that Jesus does not possess all seven of these in, its, in, in their entire fullness. He does. So what does it mean to receive? It means this. It means finally... The universe has kind of come to the realization, the recognition that this is true of Jesus. Right now, Jesus is, a, is, is the butt of humor, and his name is so often derided in curse and, and slander, isn't it? And people don't think a thing about it. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ, this and that. Doesn't even, right? The time is going to come when all of creation will come to the realization and recognition of the fact that Jesus Christ possesses all these things. He is full of power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. There is nothing lacking in the Lamb. Then a third stage occurs. It says, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. And, and Paul tells us that creation now groans, doesn't it? But the picture here is when, when, when this takes place, there, there will be a universal acknowledgement of who he is. Now here it says this, it says, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, this is what they say, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Now you notice there are four things. The first group, the, the second group has seven receives. The next one has four, but actually they're, they're essentially a repetition of the last four from the previous seven, but in reverse order, roughly. Notice it says at the, the, the seven, the last four, blessing, honor, glory, and might. Notice, oh, excuse me, I got the wrong. Um, the, the, the last four, it says might and honor and glory and blessing. And then the next group says uh, blessing, honor, glory, and might. The point is this, it's kind of like this, this last stage picks up the last four. And, and, and because the list goes from 
from one to an, the last four to the first four, and the, word, the one in the middle is blessing. And the word blessing means good word. Every word spoken then about Jesus will only be good. Will his name ever be taken in vain again? There will only be blessing. His name will finally be revered and loved and treasured for what it is. That's what's going to happen. And these, the whole of creation will say, finally, finally, Jesus gets his right place. And heaven will explode in this joy and privilege. Now, two things, and I'm, I'll be done. Two thoughts. The interesting thing is about this. This is a glorious celebration of the Lamb's victory that has yet to take place. Now, that's bizarre. I mean, think about it, for example, with take the Cubs. What happens if all of a sudden they decide to celebrate winning the World Series tomorrow? They go, you know, they get all the, you know, all the, the fanfare and all the, you know, go, drive down whatever square, Lakeshore Drive and all that and celebrate. What would people say? Huh? Why would it be nuts? They, okay, we have no idea of celebrating a victory until after we won the, won the victory. Why? Exactly. We never celebrate before because of the uncertainty. Things can happen in sports, right? I, can st- I don't watch much, much the thing, but I can remember way, way back where the Cubs were on the, on the cusp of the World Series and everything was going so well and it was, the, the guy reached over and what was the guy's name? I mean, he's... Yeah. Yeah. He picked the ball up. And you know what happened? It went down from there, right? It was catastrophic. I, like I said... Yes, but what did it do to the team? I, I mean, I, that's the only... Being honest, that's the only part of a, a world se- or a, a playoff game of the Cubs I have ever seen in my life. And I was kind of getting all excited because it was like, what was the seventh inning or something? It was the about the seventh inning of the sixth game and the Cubs were going to win the National League. It was going to be just and then it was go a to the World Series. Yes. It was going to be a cakewalk in the World Series and whoop. It was over with. It's like they say, snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat at the Cubs. Okay, so essentially, any, any sports team never celebrates until after the victory. Yeah, the fat lady sings. Well, okay, this is really strange. It's really strange because this is a celebration of victory. And, and victory has, Jesus hasn't even opened one of the seals yet, has he? Now, why is there such a celebration before the victory is won? Before the happy day has come? You know why? Because who he is, and guess what? There is, it is impossible for him not to win. Now, I think that's what John was, was given this, was this vision to give to us, to the saints. Because you know what? A lot of times when you're, when you're having your skin peeled off or where you're being crucified or when you're in prison for the faith in Christ, what do you think? This isn't going to turn out too well, is it? This isn't going to work. I, I'm, I'm, I'm losing here. And here's this celebration in heaven, this unbelievable celebration in heaven to ass- do we get a glimpse of to say, it's okay. Because the lamb, the lion, the lion, the lamb has won. It's a done deal. So done is the deal, so to speak, that the celebration precedes the victory because there's no doubt about it. And as we work our way through the book of Revelation, you know, you get to the end, and, and all of humanity amasses itself against, against Christ, and they're going to say, we're going we're to win this. We, you know, we haven't won one yet, <laughs> but we're going to win this day. And it says, Christ ascends, assembles all the hosts of heaven, but they're just spectators. <laughs> he comes back, they're all, all, you're all, you're all dressed up, and you're on, you know, white chargers and all this stuff, they come, and Jesus said, I got this covered. And what does he do? He slays them. What? With the word that comes out of his mouth. <clears throat> okay? It's a certainty. And John says to those people, by seeing this vision of heaven and to us, when it comes, and it's coming, whatever form it takes, don't worry. This is not, the, 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 the battle is not in question. The victory is not in doubt. Do not let the devil lie to you. It's certain. 
The last point is taken from verse 14. So here are the four living creatures again. They have seen the three cycles. They participated in one of them. They've seen the other two. And it says in verse 14, And the four living creatures said, Amen. Amen. So be it. Incontrovertibly certain. And the elders fell down and worshipped. As I was thinking and studying this, how do my sentiments and feelings compare with theirs? Do I feel compelled to declare with the angels as I see this, Amen. And I am, am I compelled with joy to fall down and worship the Lamb? I think most of the time we are at best, dully awake spiritually. If we were transported into this scene, what would be your emotional state? What would be your disposition at seeing the lamb and the lion? And if you're among the redeemed, you'll be in the first group singing because you're not an angel. I just wonder, you know, you look at this and, and, and it's like, mm, this is interesting, and then you go on. Are we, are our hearts so full of Christ and his rule and his reign and his sacrifice and all things discussed here that, that we, with the angel, the four living creatures, would say amen, even so, Lord, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Because we want to see you face to face. There is no treasure, there is no pleasure, there is nothing in this world more than Christ himself because finally we get a sight of him. John wants his, the people he's writing to to realize that. Because those kind of people who are enamored and enthralled with the Lamb can't be defeated even though you take their life. The people who are locked to this world, who love this world, threaten to take away what they love in this world, and what will they do? Anything you want them to do. But if your treasure is Christ in heaven, there's nothing that can, that, that, that can rip it away from you. Christ is everything. This is something, I, I was going to do it, but I don't know how many of you like Baroque music. I don't know how many of you like uh, Handel's Messiah. But if you are of that ilk, I, I want you to do, it's about, probably I think about six minutes, seven minutes. Play the last two songs of Handel's Messiah. Okay? You can, you can Google it. It's on YouTube. There's all a bunch of stuff. There's all over the place. The last two songs, Worthy as a Lamb. And the very last song of Handel's Messiah is Amen. And, and in it, it, it goes, it, it quotes uh, the phrase, to him who sits on the Lamb, and, uh, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And it's in, it's in King James language, be blessing and honor, glory and power forever and ever. And that, is, that phrase is repeated with power. Forever and ever, forever and ever. Do you long for the kingdom of Christ to, to come with a passion in your soul forever and ever, ever and ever, the Lord and the Lamb be lifted up? That is who you are if you're born of God. So much of the world has a tendency to obfuscate that. That will be freed. All that garbage will be gone. All that crud will be gone. And we will join with the saints in heaven singing a new song to the Lamb. The Lamb who bought us and the Lamb who rules. And so I pray that you would encourage yourself. Go into this text. Just put yourself there by the Spirit of God into that heavenly vision and see Christ lifted up and exalted. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And what an awesome privilege it was and is to be granted such a sight of heaven. And the amazing thing about heaven isn't, isn't that mom will be there or grandparents or friends long gone. Oh, not that they wouldn't. But in, real, in reality, in comparison to the, to the lamb, nothing matters. 
the lamb is worthy to bring about the happy day. And so, Lord, may you strengthen our hearts and minds to see and savor and share the lamb who was slain. For he alone is worthy. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.